On the issue of the country-specific recommendations, I'd just like to maybe draw two points to focus on and to discuss some comments around them. One at the broad macro level uh, and one at the micro level. Um, when we look at sort of a macro perspective, I think we can boil most economies down sort of to, to five measures, uh, looking at the economic growth, uh, the unemployment rate, the inflation rate, uh, then the, the public balance on the, the government accounts, uh, and the balance on the current account or the balance of payments. If you get those five things, you can get a general picture of, of most economies. But in Ireland over the last number of years, of course, the emphasis has been just on one, uh, the balance on the government accounts, on the public deficit, that, that bloomed in 2008 and 2009. And that has become the emphasis, that has become the focus, and will continue to be probably for the next 12 or 18 months, the objective to get the deficit down below 3% of GDP. I think most would agree that that has been the rightful target for the last number of years, simply because of the sort of precarious position uh, we find ourselves in. So focusing on, on growth, competitiveness, living standards, uh, inequality, have unfortunately been sort of pushed to the side they will hopefully eventually come back into the frame, and if there is economic growth, that the benefits can go th towards those areas. But for the moment, I think we find ourselves in a position where if there is economic growth, we can simply use it to, to continue to reduce the deficit. The target remains 3%, so I think come October, we're by and large going to see a, a, a budget where when we get to the tables, we'll see a figure of 2.9% uh, being the objective for, for 2015, that the sums will end up at being just below the 3% limit. How easy or how um, amount of austerity adjustments will be required to get to that remains up for debate. But I think there's no doubt where the conclusion will be. From last year, the figure would have been around $2 billion. But now it appears that uh, if you're aiming for a deficit just below 3%, it could be done with a lower amount of tax increases uh, and a lower amount of expenditure cuts. And there are some positive reasons for that. There are some statistical reasons for that. Like on the positive side, we, we are beginning to see some buoyancy in tax revenue. Not anywhere near where it was six, seven years ago, but it is at least a coming ahead of target that during 2008, 9, 10, we saw tax revenue by and large coming below target. Now we're beginning to see it come above target. And if that can be maintained into 2015, uh, it does give uh, a bit of a hand. Also in the, the, the government accounts, we are seeing a slightly lower number in terms of interest expenditure. So tax revenue is the money coming in. On the interest side, a couple of years ago, there would have been folks of, that we can't afford an interest bill of 10 billion. And if you look back at budgets of 2011, 2012, by 2014, 2015, a figure of about 10 billion for interest was built into those budgets. It looks like now it'll be about 8 billion uh, on the massive public debt we've built up. By and large, that's because of so the help from our European partners in terms of the reduced interest rates uh, on the ESM, ESF loans, uh, the changes in terms of the promissory notes. So there has been a, a sort of reduction there that has helped. Some of that has been used. So it has come true in 2011, 2012. Uh, and we have sort of used that uh, over the last number of years. So for example, last year, instead of being a, a 3.1 billion uh, package of tax increases and expenditure cuts, it was actually 2.5 billion, with making up the figures of once off measures to get us up to a 3.1 billion figure we could sell internationally. So some of it has been used. John, for example, mentioned the um, expenditure ceilings uh, and called them legally binding. Uh, I'm not technically sure what, what that means, but the first time we had three-year expenditure ceilings was in 2013. So it had ceilings for 2013, 2014, 2015. <laughs> they may be legally binding, but when it came to 2014, the expenditure ceilings were increased by almost half a billion. So we said in 2013 what it would be, by the time the budget came the following year, we upped it a bit. And that was in part because of the space given from the savings and interest rates, some to do with changes to do with the permission notes, which weren't necessarily savings, but it did allow that bit of space. <clears throat> so there has been sort of some flexibility over the last number of years being used. One issue with the permissory note is that no government or no member of the Department of Finance is going to say it was used for the deficit because you immediately raise the eyebrows of the ECB and be linked to monetary financing. But clearly some of the changes there were linked to things like that. Uh, on the statistical side, there will be some help this year from the CSO that the deficit is a measure, a proportion of GDP, and GDP is set to be revised up. So regardless of what happens to the deficit, as a percentage, it will become lower. <laughs> now, the CSO are getting, in a sense, some stick for some of the changes that were introduced. But by and large, these things were happened 20 years ago, and now we're only actually coming about to be in included. So in terms of some issues in relation to the informal economy, like when it comes to things like drugs, smuggling, prostitution, if you go way back to 1995, 
and what's called ESA 95, the European System of Accounts that was devised in 1995. They were supposed to be included then. Most countries excluded them simply because they couldn't measure them. What numbers are we going to put in for, for things that are either illegal, informal, or unseen? So by and large, they were ignored. One country did put them in to make their GDP far higher back in 2006, uh, and that was Greece. And they had a big jump <laughs> in their GDP figures back in 2006. But now Eurostat are looking for um, a more uniform uh, application of rules from 20 years ago um, so that countries are measuring their GDP uh, in a similar pattern. One reason for this, of course, is that our contribution to the EU budget is based on a measure from our national accounts. So if you do bump up your GDP to make your deficits a bit lower, it does cost you more in terms of EU uh, contributions. So you are starting looking for some consistency there. But by far the most significant change that's coming introduced uh, at the moment is a change in terms of research and development. So a lot of the focus has been on the informal and illegal activities, but the biggest change will be in relation to research and development. That is moving out from being an uh, intermediate consumption, so it used resources that firms had, to being actually now call, called production. It makes things. <clears throat> so before, R&D was part of the costs uh, in national accounts. Now it will be included as an output. So firms made something, the R&D and the production costs were included, and the only output measured was what they made. Now what Eurostat are saying is, well, R&D produces intellectual property. You get ideas, you get patents, you get things that are valuable. <clears throat> so R&D will move from being sort of part of the production process to, to leading to value added or output. And that will lead to a big bump in GDP, maybe around one and a half uh, or two billion. So you'll have R&D expenditure taken out of uh, production or taken out of intermediate consumption and put into value added. So that will help, not massively, maybe around uh, 0.2 percentage points. So if that wasn't there, a budget might get you to 3.2%. Now with these changes coming in from the CSO, it'll get you down to 3%. And these changes haven't always helped. If we go back to uh, 2010, the CSO were revising GDP because the crash had happened. Uh, and basically the CSO were just looking at the economy in much the same way we are, trying to gather information that's available. And they underestimated the crash initially. And in 2010, they revised down GDP and revised it down substantially. Essentially, they had sort of underestimated the crash in construction. And it was only when sort of electricity connection figures were coming through from the ESB that they saw the scale of what actually had happened and said, here, we better bring GDP down. And in that year, um, overall, there was a budget adjustment of about 5 billion. And about 1 billion of that was due to the CSO revising down GDP, that we had to stick to the excessive deficit procedure targets. And once GDP went down, it became harder to, to meet them. So these things do tend to move in swings and roundabouts. And one thing to note about them is that they're just level changes. They're changes in terms of a number, overall GDP. They have no impact on growth. So whatever the CSO are doing at the moment is not going to make growth any higher or any lower. <clears throat> one issue with the excessive deficit procedure, just to include on that, is that it's very difficult to game it. It's based on the overall deficit. How much money do you take in? How much money do you spend? What's the gap between the two of those? <clears throat> and the excessive deficit procedure is a bit of a straight racket. We, by and large, hit the targets in 2011, 12, 13, 14, and hopefully get below 3% in 2015. After that, after that then, has been mentioned, we become under the rules of the, the Stability and Growth Pact, the rules built into the, the Fiscal Compact, and they are gameable because they're based on something you can't see, the structural deficit. What would the deficit be if the economy was growing at its potential? And what's the economy's potential? Pick a number, and that's essentially it. They will try to um, revise the methods of actually doing it, but it is very difficult for Ireland. So the Commission themselves say, what were the Department of Finance doing in this year's Stability Programme update? How come you didn't tell us about the uh, structural deficit? I'm sure the Fiscal Advisory Council will be on to the Department of Finance saying, where is your estimates for the structural deficit? The issue is it's very difficult. And it is quite um, hard to come up with a single number that actually represents that. So when we exit the excessive deficit procedure, it does become more pliable. The excessive deficit procedure is a straitjacket. They just look at the overall figure and see what the outcome is. <clears throat> when we move out of that, it will become more pliable. Also, in terms of the debt break, you might say, well, surely that's a straitjacket. That is just based on your overall level of debt. Well, there is a backward-looking rule in that that says, have you brought the debt down by sufficient amounts? But there's also the forward-looking rule. Will you do it in the future? So if you've missed the targets last year, build up the numbers, say, Ash, we'll hit the target next year. And it doesn't matter for the debt break which one you hit. Did you fail last year? We will succeed next year. 
and that can be enough to satisfy the debt break, which, e which doesn't come into play in Ireland until 2018 in any event. So from the broad macro perspective, I think we'll still see the deficit being the number one objective, and hopefully we'll see a, a switch out to, to more sort of normal sort of macroeconomic policy in terms of the performance of the economy. At the micro level, <coughs> one measure that the European Commission have focused on and was mentioned by Alan was uh, the level of very low work intensity in Ireland. Now, first of all, what is that? <coughs> work intensity is essentially the proportion of time that adults in a house are working. So you could take a 12-month period. In that 12 months, how much are they working? If you work 48 weeks, it's considered 100%. And then you rank it down below that, and you get different levels. If you don't work at all, it's zero. If you work half the time, 24 weeks, you're at 50%. Very low work intensity is between 0 and 20%. So it's somebody who doesn't work at all, up to maybe about 10 weeks, just under 10 weeks, just over two months. In Ireland, the proportion of people under 65 living in households where there's very low work intensity is 24%. So about a quarter of people under 65 essentially live in households where there's very little work. Now on its own, what does that stat mean? Well, the next highest in the EU we're at 24%. The next highest in the EU is Croatia. Just a recent member, so if they weren't in, we'd be going lower again. <coughs> Croatia are next at 14%. We're a massive outlier on this measure. So they have 14% of people under 65 living in households with very low work intensity. And then you go down to different measures. The UK is about 12%. <coughs> and this is not necessarily down to unemployment. We have an unemployment rate of about 12%. There are countries in the EU with unemployment rates of 25, 26, 27%, but they are below both Ireland and Croatia for this measure of very low work intensity. And it's one that has been focused on. If you look at income inequality in Ireland, we're sort of mid-table. Whatever measure you use uh, in terms of income inequality, we tend to come out in the middle. But there is one measure of inequality that we're worst, and that is market income or earned income. The highest level of inequality in the EU for earned income is in Ireland. We have plenty of people earning and working, but we have plenty of people not. Some are part of the labour force, some aren't part of the labour force at all. <clears throat> when it comes to overall income inequality, the best system in the EU for reducing inequality is in Ireland. Our tax and transfer system improves income inequality by the most. Well, I might say that's a good thing, but one question is, well, why is it the worst to start off with? Why do we have to do such effort on income inequality to bring it from the worst for earned income to into mid-table for overall income inequality? And that measure of very low work intensity is important. Um, one issue is, well, do we want people working? Do we want people in households where, there can, where you can't have people staying at home? Yes, you do. But you don't want people growing up in an environment, particularly children, where no work happens at all. People are framed and sort of uh, built around the environment they see. And if they see an environment of very little work, that can have long-term negative consequences. So I think the emphasis the Commission put on the measure of very low work intensity is important and is one that needs to be addressed. Looking at why it happens, is it to do with the system of social welfare? Is it to do with the system of the labour market to do with education? And how do we improve in the situation? <clears throat> Just to conclude, I think this week, and perhaps tomorrow in particular, I don't think the European Commission's country-specific recommendations are going to be the document they get the highest level of uh, attention in Ireland. I think it's probably going to be just one sentence uh, in tomorrow's European Commission communique. That would be whether the, uh, the competition side are going to, to launch a, a formal investigation in relation to, to state aid and corp corporation tax. The fact that this has been leaked beforehand would suggest there's some significance to it. I think by midday tomorrow we'll be all having a, a conversation about something else. Thanks very much.